which I think is most people's number one. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Tastes Like Music. Jason, Joe, and Crams are here. It is week number three of Cramtober. Who we got this week, Cram? Cocktail Twins. Uh, that's right. We are covering the Cocktail Twins eight studio albums. Just the the core eight. They do have a collaboration album that we're not counting, and they've got like eleven EPs or something like that that we are not counting either. Sorry, I know people want us to count the EPs, but can't compare them to studio albums. We're not saying they're not good or not worth listening to. We're just you can't really apples and oranges, really. All right, so uh, exposure to the Cocteau Twins before this week, any? Joe says zero. I say all of them, but I really only recall the meat and potatoes of their catalog, like the middle six, five, essentially. Um, don't really remember listening to Garland's much, but I know I did. Don't really remember Milk and Kisses too much, but I know I did. Four Calendar Cafe, don't remember too much, but I know I did. But the other five... I knew pretty well. And I got into them around 2008 when I just got into shoegaze in general. I was listening to them and Ride and all kinds of stuff in that realm. I really got into, you know, my buddy Valentine and all that. And just had like a bunch of mixed CDs with just a bunch of different like bands like that and like the Dream Syndicate and all of this sort of stuff that were just all over it. Loved it. Fell in love with it. Still love it. I actually take that back. I did listen to Garland's because we are doing 1982 and I didn't finish it. Didn't finish it, but I did listen to it. And I also thought it was the Cockatoo Twins until I looked it up online. I actually, I, I found a clip of them performing on Jay Leno and I was like, all right, I gotta, I gotta hear how this, this band actually is pronounced. So I did my homework. All right. Talk to. Cockatoo. Cockatoo. Cockatoo after dark. Uh, for, for me, I knew songs really here and there, uh, not full albums. I've heard the Cockatoo Twins before. I'm aware of what their sound is, but that's about it. Going into this, I'm not intimately familiar with any of the LPs prior to this week. Now I am. So let's get into it. Who shall start us off? I think I should continue to start off. And so I will. The only album I have at sub three stars is an album I used to like a lot. And I'm not sure why I used to really like it a lot. But now I find it just decent. And that's Victoria Land. This one is much more subtle. It's very relaxing. It's full of serenity. It's still really scenic. I still really like the sound. I'm never not going to like this whimsical dream pop shoegaze mashup sound. And I also really love that their albums almost always sound like the album cover to me. This one almost ex is the best example of that. It's just like a big like red cloud like barrage. But to me, it really lacks a lot of vibrancy. It's a very sleepy record. I wouldn't say boring. I would say it's kind of challenging. But I do think it falls flat emotionally a good bit. You're not getting those powerhouse sort of vocal performances from Fraser. It kind of sounds to me like it's someone that knows how to produce the Cocktoo Twin sound, but really has no idea what the heart and soul of the band is or how to really get the songs going. I enjoy it as like a front to back kind of listen. It's just sort of like this tapestry of atmosphere. But is it memorable at the end? Not really for me. It doesn't really stick for me. And it's not like if I ever saw them live, I'd be like, oh, I really need these tracks from Victoria Land. No. So I'm going 2.5. It's decent. I don't need to seek it out, but it doesn't bother me. The bottom for me, and I think probably for most people, the correct answer is Garland's The Debut from 1982. It's the only record of those theirs with Will Heggie on bass. Every review of this record references the overt uh, Susie and the Banshees influence. 
Uh, but this is like the Susie before they got good. Uh, and I can't stand the drum machines on this album. They sound like trash. There was a positive review of the record that I read that that praised the drum machines and said it's basically electronic beats with noise on top. And yeah, that's exactly how I feel. It's basically electronic beats with noise on top and not much else. I think Eliz Elizabeth Frazier doesn't sound anything like the singer she would develop into. I think her singing on this record is pretty poor. It's like she doesn't even know how to sing. I think her voice is not really developed at all. In general, I'm not really sure what the goal here was. I don't think it's beautiful or dreamy enough to really like be a good dream pop record, but it's also like not dark or ugly enough to, to be interesting in that sort of way either. There's no tunes. There's no melody. I just don't know what to grab onto here. There wasn't really a single moment on this that I thought was cool or interesting. So this is a low two stars. I almost went 1.5. I think it's pretty weak. Wow. Jason laying the hammer down on Garland's. Uh, first time I listened to it, I didn't grasp on anything. Uh, listening to it before even... I don't even know if we knew Cuck 2 Twins was happening. But I was listening for 1982, and it just wasn't my thing. I was listening to, like, Rio and Number of the Beast and stuff, so I uh, wasn't that interested. But I, I went back, obviously, with this week, and, you know, I, I think there's some interesting stuff here. I do agree with Jason and Jason's reviewers that he quoted. It's very Susie and the Banshees. Like, it is just obviously we want to be influenced by sushi in the, in the banshees and it's you know it's monotone and monotonous it's post-punk what do you expect it's none of it's good so you know you take the little things you take the little things i like the drum machines i think they're cool i think the idea of having drum machines is awesome and obviously they're all going to get way better elizabeth frazier doesn't sound great here uh the drum machines are interesting i think more interesting than good uh, but there's some cool, you know, um, cool stuff in here. I love the name Blood Bitch for a song. Your <laughs> your first song, yeah, it's called Blood Bitch. That's awesome. Uh, and the song itself is pretty cool. It's got a dark mechanical, like electronic vibe to it. It's spooky. It would be a great song for a horror movie soundtrack. And, you know, Frazier's doing kind of that goatee vocal style that was popular at the time. She grew out of that, fortunately. But uh, it kind of brings her down to sort of like common man like she's no no not a goddess on this album we'll say she's a, a common you know vocalist so nothing too special there the bass is very post-punk and kind of monotonous and barren and um i don't know it i couldn't really pick out too many songs but i think blood bitch is good and uh blind dumb duff blind dumb deaf ooh. Uh, isn't bad either so i i don't know it kind of grew on me i have it at three stars mm -hmm. i don't love it but i don't hate it so i don't hate it at all so a good start i definitely don't hate it we're gonna be talking about that later my number seven is four calendar cafe and i think they're getting a little bit out of their comfort zone here trying to grow out of a sound that was pretty familiar for about 10 years I think there's some missteps with some of their sonic textures, but the vibe in the songs are still good. Like I really like that kind of funky kind of guitar sound on the lead off track. Some of the music doesn't really fit or some of the songs don't really fit like the performances and the instruments and all of this and the styles and the genres. There's a it's a little bit clashed at times, but I do like Evangeline. It's slow. It's lazy. It's drowsy. It's got those big snare hits. I love Bluebeard. I expect this may be on some of your top 10 lists because it's kind of got this shoegaze gothic guitar twang, almost like Cosmic Country almost, a nice little slide to it. So it's cool that they are kind of spreading their wings and trying new things instead of just doing Heaven or Vegas 2. Um, the whimsicalness is mostly here. Theft and Wandering Around lost uh bringing in a big bass boost so there's i think a big bass kind of uh presence on this album 
but I think some of the songs are a bit too thin in the production department for me, like Oil of Angels. I really want that beautiful heavenly mess of noise everywhere. Like Squeeze Wax has some nice breeziness to it, but you're just kind of missing that like lovely clutter, that just lush cloud of Cocteau Twins noise on this. Some of it does deliver, but like My Truth is pretty aimless and kind of sounds like she's singing against a generic backing track. Essence is a bit flat. Summerhead is awesome, though. And Purr might be the best song on the record. I don't know why it didn't open the record. But uh, I still think it's good enough for me to like. So I'm going three stars. Number seven for me for Calendar Cafe. I am shocked to see Joe starting out at three stars at the bottom for Garland. That's blowing my mind right now. I guess I'm the big uh, Cock Two Twins hater this week then. Uh, number seven for me is Bluebell Knoll. Uh, Raymond comes back into the fold after missing Victoria Land. He was off playing with other bands. This one's kind of splits the difference of their previous records. It's more song forward than Victoria Land was but it it does retain a lot of that album's really ethereal approach fraser's vocals however on this record irritate me probably more on this record than any other uh she spends a lot of time in her upper register sounding like kate bush a lot of the time and i don't like kate bush's voice either there's something about like this way of singing that's really proper it's almost like show tuny or like musical theater which i really don't like and she does that sometimes not all the time And I think she does it a lot here on a track like Carolyn's Fingers. She's rolling her R's a lot, leaning really heavily into her Scottish accent. And I just don't like the way that sounds very much. I think it's pretty annoying. However, when she brings her voice down an octave, like on a kissed out red float boat, I think uh, it works much better. I like that track's uh, keyboard sounds. It's got this like high part, which... I don't know, it might be like an arpeggiator or something, but it puts like this really nice sparkle on the track. Aside from that, though, I don't think it's got a lot of memorable stuff on it. Fraser's vocals aren't really doing it for me, and I think the instrumental stuff all all feels kind of like cookie cutter at, at this point. You've got like this dreamy guitar tone slathered over a drum beat with, you know, some some chimey sort of synths going on. It all kind of, it's, it's, it's kind of cocktoos by numbers. I think almost every song is kind of constructed in the same way. They all use the same sounds. All the guitar tones throughout the record are pretty much the same. Uh, And I don't find it very memorable or impressive or very, very much of anything at all. So it's just two and a half stars for me. What a joke. (laughs) (laughs) I'm Mm. uninterested and unimpressed by her singing on Bluebell Knoll, but some white dude named Kevin Simpson (laughs) Smith finds an old Chinese uh, takeout menu and reads it with piano in the background. It's the most brilliant thing ever. It's like, get out of here. We should have seen this coming because it is very Kate Bushy. And uh, I, I thought he'd have a little more sense and a little more taste, but you know, he's lost. He's lost to us. Got a, he's got a pirate in the background. That's all you need to know. Uh, my number seven is me, Victoria Land. And this is a... Oh, yes, there. Um, this is a very pretty album. It is so pretty that there's like nothing underneath it. It's the prettiest crepe paper you've ever seen. It's there's just no depth, like absolutely none. There's no, I mean, there is bass, but they did this without the bass player. Um, so it's just Elizabeth Fraser and Robin Guthrie, no Simon or Raymond. Uh, so it's just missing like that oomph, that little, you know underneath all that bass it was played by Guthrie on this but uh, it's obviously not there um and they're obviously trying for something different it's very ornamental it's very you know renaissance fair at times uh, i think the songs just float by without uh, making too much of an impact for the most part i think fraser's voice fraser fraser fraser's voice is really fantastic like she sounds great she's putting little filigrees on everything a lot of the rolling r's that jason hates but for some reason he likes it here uh lyrics totally unintelligible no idea what she's saying most of the time doesn't matter because it sounds beautiful and um i don't know i just didn't grasp any of these songs until the final two i do like how to bring a blush to the snow and 
the thinner the air a lot. There's some cool quivering strings on how to bring a blush to the snow. It's gothic, a little bit spooky. And that trend continues on closer the on closer, the thinner the air. Some of these titles are a little outrageous. Uh, this is even like a crazy one. The Bluebell Knoll titles are just like, what the hell? Where does that even come from? She seems to just choose words, just how they come out of her mouth, which is cool. Like it's a different approach, but I don't know. Sometimes like on this album, like I miss like some kind of meaning to the words. Like it just doesn't seem like it means anything. It's just pretty, but it's all surface. Um, so I think it's impressive and I'm gonna go three and a half stars for this one, but just it, it it's missing something. And you know, I think Kramzer gets it. <laughs> Yeah, it looks like on a bizarre turn of events, Jason is going to be the pinata in the Cocktoo Twins fandom here. Number six for me, I've got Milk and Kisses, their final record. I've got it at three stars, which means I think it's good. I think it seems a little bit lost with the sound or at least like the sound they're going for versus how they're kind of mixing it and putting it together in the studio. Like they still want it to be a little bit stripped down, like um, how cafe was, but I think they're putting a little bit more into it. And frankly, I just think the songs are better on milk and kisses. Sometimes they're incorporating a little bit of that mid nineties sounds. Like I think this is 96, but they're like keeping that alien angel kind of vocal style. So it like never gets too far away from what they're all about. Uh, Serpent Skirt is this really cool kind of steady, slow, rainy coolness to it. Tish Bite. I don't know. It's kind of that lame, sunny flower power 90s rocker, but done in cocktoo style. I actually think uh, Half Gifts is quite lovely. And I think it's a good album. I just think it's kind of like light in the load. Like this is what they do well just not their best version of it um Rilke and Hart really pretty there's just something missing on this album to kind of put it over the edge um and I wouldn't even say like I'm not even quite sure what it is because I think the songs kind of live up and could maybe even afford a bunch of them to be on other albums like Ups is cool Epperdu is nice just got no lasting power for me um Treasure Hiding might hit that pinnacle that most of their songs and every other album kind of hit but it's just not enough and it comes to the end and i'm a little bit drained by the time i get to it i still like listening to it and i'll go back to it um so yeah milk and kisses i'm going three stars it's my number six all right my number six is head over heels their second record don't look at me like that I, I, you can look at me like that for bluebell Knoll, but not for this one this one this one belongs down in the bottom half. This record is just Guthrie and Frazier, just a two-piece on this one. I think Frazier's vocals on this one are much improved from the debut, and I think the production of them is a lot better here. Still not a big fan of the drum machine, but I think the sounds are starting to get better on this record uh, from, from Garland's. I think they're a step up. Sugar Hiccup, I think that's like the real beginning of their dream pop sound, going beyond those post-punk roots. In our Angelhood, I think... It's a pretty cool track. It's got like this fast post-punk sort of thing happening, but it actually has like a little bit of groove to it. It has some good melody. The vocals, though, I think are a little bit washed out. It's not her singing of them, but it's just the amount of reverb for this type of track is not working. It should be a little drier, I think. Uh, My Love Paramore, I think, is a pretty interesting track with some cool production. I like the guitar sounds on it. It has this really big, full atmosphere to it. But for every bit of progress that they make, I think there's another kind of little bit of self-sabotaging regression going on. Glass Candle Grenades is just kind of noisy filler, multi-foiled. Could, I think, be a pretty cool song in a cool direction for them. It's got like this jazzy feel, but with the drum machine attempting to do that, it's just not working at all. That kind of swing feel is not happening. So uh, I don't know. I, I think there's areas of this record that are, are pretty good, but also some real duds. So two and a half stars for Head Over Heels. Joe, if Ian McCulloch said lips like sugar, sugar hiccups, would you have been more impressed? No, I have things to say about sugar hiccups soon. Not quite, not quite yet. I have Milk and Kisses as my number six. And, you know, 
it's hard to talk about this one without talking about disappointment and hard to talk about it without talking about heaven or las vegas and it's just the direction they took after that into the 90s here i mean i know they didn't want to make heaven or las vegas 2 but this one just like it goes too far down the path of like 90s alternative sounding to me uh, you definitely get like a little bit of like massive attack and um, some of that trip hop influence in the grooves a little bit, especially on the violin, which has some nice sharp edged guitars, but it's just, it's so 90s sounding. It almost like throws you off because you're so used to like this lush, you know, gothic and then dreamy and then, you know, all the changes they went through, but it was like that 80s style. And then here in 96, you're getting like, I don't know. It's just not the same. It's not what I want. I know people are going to yell at me. It's not what you want. It is what I want. Um, I, I think it's still pretty good. I think um, Frazier gets a real like Karen Carpenter vocal going for Tish Bite. It has a nice upbeat, you know, major key kind of air to it. And it's, it's pretty decent. Uh, Epperdu has a nice oceanic feel. There's some soft cymbals and, you know, like sea light guitars um some i think there's some like rain fx in there at the end really kind of drives it home a little too much maybe but um you know that r and b sound is gone and it's just i don't know it it's missing what i loved about previous records and it just goes too far the band's sort of falling apart at this point anyway um still sounds good fraser's vocals are a little to you know turn down they're not quite as outrageous as the 80s she's not really doing much kate bush anymore i don't know the drum machines are eh the beats are eh vocals still sound nice some nice guitar in there um but it's not that memorable it's a little samey and it's safe like it, it just feels like a really safe album and i just i want something more i expect more from them i don't think it's bad i think it's nice it's three and a half stars but I don't think I'd really go back to it. I don't really see the reason point to. All right. I think that's pretty fair, especially for Joe. Top five Cocteau Twins albums. I got Garland's here and I got it at 3.5. I think it's really good. It's also the score I gave Cut the Crap. I think this is very cool, cold, dark, and icy album. It feels haunted. It feels ghoulish. And I think everything plays into that like you're uncomfortable listening to it with like the drum machines and kind of the aimless nature of the songs. Like none of it offers you like any sort of comfort or warmth. Joe's right. The opener blood bitch is super cool. I just love the mood and the sound and the style of these. I love these really like dark gloomy, uh, you know, like fallen angel kind of sounding albums gives you like early teens horror vibes to it. Wax and Wayne has that creepy chant backing vocal that I really love. I like the vocals on this album a lot. Um, I think they have a really cool dissonance to them and kind of like sci-fi feel almost like being these troubled little like computer tech poetic butterflies or something like I, I get so much vivid imagery and just stuff from the feelings from the sound of these albums. And I actually think the mix is good. I think it accomplishes what it's supposed to accomplish. Uh, Blind Dumb Deaf is great. The pedal guitar stuff I think is great, like sounding like a city of, like on fire with ambulances and alarm sirens just everywhere. So cool. It's just a tapestry of dark, trippy, frigid liveliness. It's like uh, Shallow Than Halo is really cool. And I'm the drum machine, like just I think is perfect. I'm with Joe. It makes it really static and stiff and accomplishes the feel that it wants to go for because it's like kind of new wave. It was like this haunted kind of tech feel, which was perfect during like the big tech boom of the 80s. Um, I think there's a sick guitar lead in Shallow Than Halo. Title track has a really cool disturbing bass line on it. I think everything is really expressive and just creates this really ultra kind of like horrific mood. And they don't have a lot of like beauty into it yet. And they will. There's just like this cool lost soul, like depravity to it that I like and it it hits the spot for me 3.5 for garlands really good no it's not yes it is all right next up for me number five 
Victoria Land. And I agree with each of your assessments of it for the most part. You know, they're back to a two-piece for this one. The new bass player, Raymond, was off making a record with this mortal coil. So I don't know if it was because of his absence that like influenced the direction of the record or not, but they make this very airy record, not much percussion, not much bass. And I do think it is, like you guys said, a pretty record. Uh, I like the guitar tones, and I, I think they're starting to kind of nail down the production approach that works best for them on this record. That said, and like you guys have already said, it's so light and so airy that it kind of drifts maybe a little too far into like new age territory. It's like all atmosphere, and the songs are like barely there at all. Um, and even though the sound is beautiful, I think the record feels a little too inconsequential. Uh, not even that much to say about it beyond what you guys have already said. It's just like mood music and it's like the same guitar tone throughout. And I don't know, it's just like him playing guitar <laughs> basically the whole time with the same tone and not much else going on. Um, I don't know. I will say the guitar line on Fluffy Tufts sounds a lot like the lead instrument line on uh, The Cutter by Echo. Very, very similar melody. Um, just thought I'd point that out for Joe. Two and a half stars for Victoria Land. They're they're ripping off Echo, like Echo ripped off you too. Wow. Wow. Breaking news. Um, I got head over heels. We're still at three and a half stars, but we're we're getting close to four, I think. And this one I didn't listen to that much. I kind of kept forgetting about it. I would go from Garland to Treasure. So I, this one kind of got lost in the shuffle. And um, going back to it, you know, it's still in that sushi, 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 and the Banshees mode. Uh, it's very similar, uh, multifoiled, especially. And, you know, it's, it's a decent sound, but it's like sushi before they got like better, you know, in the late 80s. It's still that post punk sound it's um i think this one definitely sounds better than garland's though it's sonically it's just a lot of noise a lot of guitars and synths and, and bass all kind of swirling together and sometimes it overwhelms fraser's voice which you don't want to do because she is getting a lot better like even by this point she's much better much more in control of her voice uh and they do some uh interesting stuff um five ten fifty fold they throw some horns in there which is cool it's still you know very ominous and dark and it's got this brooding bass line um but the horns and then fraser's voice uh, she's wailing and swooping and swooning around uh the music and it sounds really good i would like sugar hiccup but the words sugar hiccup are just awful and she continuously says it. She repeats it throughout the entire song. It is a terrible, like, vote, lyrical hook. And it's a very lovely sounding song. Yes, it's the beginning of dream pop. It doesn't matter. I don't want to listen to it because I hate the words sugar hiccup. Terrible. Um, Our Angelhood. Uh, no, you know, it's, it's, like a, it's like a goulash. It's not a good stew of sounds. And yeah, I messed that up. Uh, our angel has a ringing, distorted bass line. The guitars and vocals sort of meld and swirl together in a big old post punk stew, but it's it's like an average stew, like a goulash, not like a beef stew or you know something high end. And um, you know, glass candle grenades is very dissonant. Didn't love it. And the gold rush and the dust and the gold dust rush is fine. It's fine, um, but. A little too much Susie in the Banshees. Until the end, music and drums is pretty sweet, though. That 80s guitar attack, those thumping war drums. Probably the best on the album. It was a little more live, a little less post-punk. So they're getting there. Uh, all the elements are there, I think, on this one. And it's just really super close to busting out. And they will on the next album. So good for that. Joe just hates sugar as a noun descriptor. Like he just he just hates it. Sugar anything, and it's like Sugar Mountain didn't make his top ten Neil Young song list. Like not not it's just not gonna happen. My number four is Head Over Heels, but I'm up to four stars. I think this is a great album. 
starts off with those big like sonic booms that sound like it's right out of like Blade Runner, which just <laughs> takes uh, so it's automatic starts at a five star right there just from that noise alone. Blade Runner is my favorite film of all time. I think the sounds on this album are just so cool. Much more of like a classical shoegaze kind of predecessor with the vibe. Very hazy and dreamy. I would also say it's a bit cerebral. You still got some of that venom and like sp spooky isn't even hard enough, like horror kind of vibe from the first album. Still pretty drony, hypnotic, unpredictable, um, which seem like those shouldn't go together, but it, they do. Um, and it's just what makes it so good. Like um, when Mama Moth, Mama was a moth, Mama was moth, excuse me. So good. I love the drum sounds on this album. I just love 80s reverb drumming. I just always will. But I think there's like an artistic quality to this album that feels really primal, especially when Frazier's doing her like screams and her yells and stuff. 5, 10, 50 fold, really cold, really cool, uh, hard, like blood stroke kind of sensation to it with the string or the synth kind of coming in. The atmosphere is perfect. The production and the professionalism is a big step up, even from Garland's. I love the use of saxophone on uh, 5, 10, 50 fold. Still really cool horrific elements, but they're bringing in like this uneasy beautifulness to it. Sugar Hiccup has that pretty disposition that I love. I love the Dream Pop. It's all over. If you want to know how much I love Dream Pop, watch albums of the year or songs of the year from like 2009 to 2016. It's just littered in there. The Sunny Goth style I really dig. Uh, Robin Guthrie's lush, charismatic guitar work is just twice as good here as it is on the debut. And our angelhood brings some big, heavy pulse to it. So you get a good variety of stuff on the album in their very specific sound. It's not just like one kind of, they have one sound and they know how to write it two different ways. They know how to do a lot of different stuff with their sound, which is really impressive. And the Gold Dust Rush is great and has those big, wide open, angelic guitar strokes. Tinderbox, a big percussion piece. Slithers, kind of like a snake in like these sticky, ashy shadows. Really cool. I like Multifoiled a lot. I think it has this cool underworld kind of like jazz bar feel to it um i love paramore love the guitar on that the devilish just like kind of sexiness is everything i want in this sound and it's so close to just coming all together here and but i think it's really good four stars for head over heels for me it's great all right my number four is milk and kisses their final album you guys both described it as a disappointment and i agree um it's getting a little more reverb heavy again. The songs are getting a little lost. Fraser's vocals are all of a sudden getting breathier again. And in a lot of ways, I feel like they're reverting back to the things that I struggled with and all their eighties material. Um, the, the drum machines, which, which had kind of worked itself out and were sounding pretty good on the previous records are suddenly sounding worse again. And the record I think sounds very of its time also, um, even though they're kind of like going back to what they were doing in the eighties, it still sounds very much like a mid nineties record. I don't know. I don't, I don't think it's great. I don't think the songs are that great. The one bright spot for me on this record is Tish Bite, which Joe, um, mentioned. Uh, I think it has a really strong melody. It's really direct. And she does these like pointed, uh, kind of like response vocals at the end of the track, which she also does on the previous record on, on Bluebeard. And I just love the way her voice sounds when she sings like that. I wish she sang like that all the time. I think it sounds so cool. Uh, sounds really good. Um, so I really like that track a lot. But overall, I found this to be a pretty big letdown after they had made, I think, some pretty considerable progress through the early part of the 90s. So two and a half stars for Milk and Kisses. Jeez. God. God. Wow. Will we get to three stars for jason he will he'll get there maybe three and a half i don't know cares cares anymore uh my number four i got four calendar cafe and it's four stars yay um <laughs> <laughs> but it came out in 1993 oh um i think the first thing you notice with this one <laughs> is how different it is from heaven or las vegas just the production off the bat it is super 90s like that acoustic guitar sound i know who you are at every age it's just like oh it's 1993 or two or like the first half of 1994 like it's just such a, a giveaway 
and um i mean that that's okay but it, it's a it's, it's a step down like it's it's a dis a little bit of a disappointment creeping in the first time i heard this after heaven in las vegas uh, fraser's vocals a little more shoegaze i think a little more whispery uh not a lot of that r&b style that she developed out of the blue almost on heaven in las vegas not a lot of bass on this one either uh, it seems like just a bunch of whole notes and I don't know it doesn't seem to anchor like it, it just sort of holds the the melodies in place but it doesn't really add to them at all it, it's really all about uh, Fraser's flights of fancy and the little filigrees and everything uh, Guthrie's guitar you know stands out as far as the tone and, and everything and it, it seems a little bit more up front even a little more you know, it's it's like 50-50 now with Fraser's voice. Um, and the songs are good. I think by the time they got to Heaven in Las Vegas, like the, the early early albums, songs kind of were secondary to just letting things go and letting things sort of ramp up in this beautiful you know, cacophony of noise. And here they're writing songs. I think uh, Evangeline, Bluebird, uh, Summerhead, these are all strong, strong songs. Um, Deft and Wandering Around Lost has some really nice vocal layering. Um, she's definitely doing that Kate Bush-like waver, um, but there's some nice sweeping guitar in there. Bluebeard, like Graham just said, has like a little Americana. I don't know if it's an actual lap steel or something that just sounds like a lap steel, but pretty close from uh, Guthrie on that. My Truth has like a little bit of a trip hop drum beat to it, which is cool. And uh, Summerhead has a little edge to the guitar, which is nice, a little more energy. And I, I think it's good. And I think it would be better maybe if it wasn't directly after Heaven at Las Vegas. And maybe it retained a little bit more of that DNA. So I, it's it's a four-star record. I think it's, it's very cool. It was one I'd never heard of. I didn't know what they did after Heaven at Las Vegas, so. It was, a, it was a nice surprise to hear them branching out a little bit. So it, it's good. It's four stars. Oh, man. It's like you guys I completely just projected you guys would have like the opposite opinions of what you do. And then Joe would be playing Jason and Jason would be playing Joe. And I'd be here playing myself. But I played the audience here. I think most people thought this would be my number one. It's probably going to be Joe's, and I might lose some people here. My number three is Heaven or Las Vegas, which I think is most people's number one. Spit take. Um, I got it at four stars. I think it's great. There's something about this album that does not get me over to the hump into like, Aruga, kind of like Gaga eyes over. I don't know what it is. Um, and we've come across some of these albums before where it's like, I should like this more than I do, but I don't. And I enter this album in, I think I nominated it for album of the year in 1990, which is a weak year. But like, I have it in my computer, I have it on my document, and I have Heaven or Las Vegas, and then I put a four next to it. And then I'm like, the point five just doesn't look right next to it it doesn't feel right cherry color funk really good pitch the baby with those great program shoegaze drums is great there's a lot more flavor and bass and low end to this album there's more rhythm it's kind of funky and i think there's kind of a cool poshness to it and i think there's almost like a fashionista sense at times like the swagger like in pitch the baby like almost runway model-esque I think there's some danciness to it, like especially an Ice Blink Luck. 50-50 Clown is really cool. I love that icy organ sound. Very Genesis-ish. Genesis-y? genesis Or Genesis-ish? Whatever. It sounds a little bit like some of the early 80s stuff on like Duke and Abacab with that organ sound. Very cool. Key sound. Title track is one of the most essential shoegaze kind of tracks of all time. The album has just this really cool creativity and confidence to me and like a sexuality and vibrancy. But for me, it's not the sweet spot of why I love Cocktoo Twins. I need it to be a little more innocent than this. This one's like a little bit like seductive and come here where I want it to be kind of just like that, like angel like flying above you and is here to give you like dark, warm vibes. 
So I don't know. I still think it's great. Four stars means great. It does seem a little forced to me. I don't know what it is. I still love it. Uh, Fatsa Politic is rocking. It's like pretty close to like a standard rock song with like big drum clashes and stuff and big guitar spots. I love it. Wolf in the Breast almost sounds a little bit like some of the Alanis Morissette nonsense nonsense she does when she's like and throughout the catalog i like get a lot of stuff that comes out like four or five years later like oh this guitar part sounds like something the sundays do or this melody sounds like something dolores does for the cranberries or you know just like i think they were hugely influential in a lot of stuff i do think it kind of other than fruit fruit foxes and midsummer fires kind of ends on a little bit of a weaker note the last like quarter of the album but i do still think it's great maybe one day it'll like really click and i'll get it up to four five or five but great is still good great is still cool great is still great um so that's my number three don't be that upset come on all right my number three is treasure i think a big improvement over the first two albums shedding most of the post-punk sound here for what would become their signature sound i think there's some really memorable melodies and hooks finally on this record i think the main hook in lorelei is very catchy and i've already talked a little bit about fraser's voice and her singing and i think on this record you really get a lot of the different sounds of her voice um you have some of the stuff i like some of the stuff i don't like as much there's times where she like sounds like Snow White in the 1930s Disney movie, which I'm not a, a big of uh, that big of a fan of. But there's other times like on Persephone where her voice is much more like pointed and direct. And I really like her vocals on that song and in that style. I don't know the band. The band felt that like this record was rushed and unfinished and Guthrie called it their worst by a mile. Um, but I think it is one of their best selling records. Um, so what does he know? I think it is quite front loaded though, um, with Lorelai and Pandora and Evo all coming in the in the first half. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of standouts on side two, but far from their worst record. Uh, I think it's light years better than Garland's, and I think it's a decent record. I've got it at three stars. Wow, three stars, and then Crams are. I'm still haven't recovered from that. A bomb that he dropped on all of us. My number three and my three and two are just like oh, so close together. I went back and forth with them. And it's really just I listened to one more recently and it's sticking in my mind. So I put it at number two. Number three is going to be Bluebell Knoll. And it makes me it proffers the question what if? Kate Bush went a little crazier and just made up her own language. And that's what it feels like to me. Like the one thing I struggle with, with this band for all of these po or pre heaven in Las Vegas albums is the lyrics just don't mean anything. And it's hard to like assign meaning to them. Like I, I want them to mean something, even if they were in a different language, like a real, like Swedish or something. Like if this was like ABBA singing in Swedish, at least like they would have heft and weight to the lyrics. And the fact that they don't, it makes it a little hard for me to go like sky high. So I'm still at four stars here because I just think it sounds absolutely beautiful. The harpsichord sound uh, right off the bat on the title track, just such a cool, specific, unique sound like it just doesn't exist anywhere outside of like 1987-88 and it, it just sounds so cool um like really specific 80s sci-fi horror to it almost and um you know she's dropping all these nonsense words and sound effects and the he he he's and then like just all this like little things that she's doing with her her vocals but it sounds so good. Like it doesn't even matter. Like the level of singing that she gets to on this album is, I don't know, top 10 female vocals of all time. Maybe it's just unbelievably pretty. And then Guthrie drops like that jet plane guitar at the 
outro just comes like swooping in. It's such a cool track. Absolutely love it. Um, and then, they, you know, the rest of the album, they're doing a whole bunch of different stuff. Uh, I like Athel Bros a lot. Uh, some major chords in there. It's dreamy, but it's not like shoegazy. It's like uplifting, uh, delightful. Fraser's doing a lot of those rolling over R's, unconventional word choices, the, the lyrics, the singing styles. It's just, she's off in her own, completely own world. And it's great. Caroline's, fing Caroline's Fingers uh, reminds me of um, Heaven is 10 Zillion Light Years Away by Stevie Wonder, that clavinet, clavichord, whatever type of instrument that kicks it off, which is really cool. I have Fraser sounds like a 30s Disney princess here. So we are on the exactly the same, but I like that, whereas Jason hates that. Um, and she's just like the sky busting range that she shows off is incredible. Uh, for Phoebe, still a baby, just bursting the seams with beautiful vocals and harmonies and layers. And it's just so cool. Uh, Itchy Globo Blow sounds a little bit like uh, Breathing from Kate Bush. Uh, it's like a gothic jangle to it. Seco buff, a uh, little lighter touch on that, carefree, just like effortlessly dancing across these notes. And um, the 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 titles on this last second half, Sicko buff, suckling the mender, spooning good singing gum, a kissed out red float oat, Ella mega last bro, like what the hell is that? Like, come on, try a little harder to be coherent. Um, but it's great. There's this uh, cool 8-bit twinkling on a kissed out red float boat, which is great. And this, I think, for the first time is where she shows off a little bit of that R&B. And she, she gets a little Annie Lennox, I think, on this one, which is really cool. A uh, nice harbinger of what's to come. And I think the songs are just better. Like, they're more memorable. It's not like Victoria Land, where it's, like, pretty, but I forget about them. Like, these stick with me. And I think if they had real lyrics, they might be like four and a half, five stars. But I'm going to go with four for now. But I really do like it a lot. Jason's face when you said it's a top 10 female vocal. So awesome. Ah, you're so right, Joe. Jason's like, no, it's Courtney Marie Andrews going, my tea is cold. Come on. All right. Treasure is my number two. I've got it at 4.5. Really great. The loveliness coming in a little more on this one. A lot more, actually. The vocals are just so unique and beautiful. Yeah, I don't think it's quite the masterful work as Bluebell Knoll. But fraser has got to be at least a top 20 female vocalist of all time for me. Always seems like she's just got this vibe of like conjuring up some like ancient like womanly goddess with her singing. It's so cool. Evo is great. Getting more creative with the percussion here other than those big, powerful, smoky reverb drums. Lorelei is such a beautiful piece. Beatrix has some really cool sounds on it. Feels like an old, like, spring-loaded, like, creepy toy that's, like, bending out of shape. Persephone with the big drums and the big guitar part, really ferocious with its patience and fire, and her voice is so strong on it. I love her vocal pattern on Pandora just like they have their own world and operate so dynamically and have like diversity within itself too. Like they have their own culture and language, not just in music, but reality. Like they're like alien angels to me. It's so cool. Sublime and miraculous oddities, alien poetry. The sound and vibes are just so great to me. I just love the feel. Amelia sounds like this like old religious hymn on like a different planet or something. Um, I think Aloysius is just pure beauty. Like, if you can't, if you don't like this music, then you don't like music. You just like the radio. Like, there's a difference. You gotta, you gotta be able to just lose yourself in the, the beauty of human beings putting together these sounds into something that is sonically pleasing and emotes and gets reactions out of you. Uh, Cicely Strong with the drumming. I love the guitar sound. Sounds like the strings will break at any second, like very harpish, so thin sounding. Um, Otterly is low-key and enchanting. Domino is really epic. Very close to five stars for me. I just think they can do a little bit better. And they do. So Treasure, 4.5 for me. 
All right. My number two is for Calendar Cafe, which is, I think, after having our Las Vegas a step further towards pop, cleaner, clearer vocals, distinguishable lyrics. Although I don't think it's really that big of a departure from Heaven or Las Vegas. I think the sound is pretty similar. Bluebeard is great. What's with that face? They were already heading in that direction. That's where they were going. They were like one step away from there. Uh, Bluebeard, like Cram said, it's a great song. Uh, probably my favorite Elizabeth Fraser vocal performance. When she comes in at the end of that song, when she's doing like those ad lib responses, just sounds so good. I really wish she sang like that all the time. Um, like I said, similar approach to he Heaven or Las Vegas. I just don't think the melodies are as, quite as strong. The exception to that being Bluebeard, which I think has a great melody. Also, though, I think this record is a little front loaded with Evangeline, the album's other single being near the front. Oil of Angels, probably my third favorite track, which finishes off the first half of the record. And then the back half, not quite as strong. You get stuff like Essence near the end that has them kind of like falling back into old habits. But I think the front half is pretty decent and Bluebeard is great. So three and a half stars for Four Calendar Cafe. Well, I, I don't think it sounds like Heaven or Las Vegas. I don't think it's even close, Jason. Um, my number two is going to be Treasure. And, you know, this... I think it's a huge leap forward after Head Over Heels. It's just so much prettier and simple as that. All the post-punk stuff is basically just wiped away and they're making beautiful, ethereal, dreamy. You know, it's not quite pop, but it's pretty darn close. Um, and I think they finally take the reins off Frasier. Like they, I think they realize that she is the star. Like she is what makes everything tick. It's like a, a college football coach finally giving his star true freshman quarterback the whole playbook. Like you just take the reins off, you let him out there, slinging it around. That's Elizabeth Frazier to me, just using her voice as a weapon to make every one of these songs just incredible sounding. Um, and she does. I mean, every single vocal part is just awesome. And uh, I think the tunes are a lot stronger. I love, I think this is really where Guthrie gets the drum programming right, uh, because it just sounds so cool, the juxtaposition between those just dreamy vocals and like that hammering 80s, uh, almost like Depeche Mode, like drum uh, machines, which is great. Persephone, Sicily, Aloysius, Lorelei, just the drum sounds on there are so cool. It's a really cool, unique sounding album. You just don't get that combination anywhere. And the, the songwriting is so much better. Um, Lorelei is just incredible. It feels like a Christmas song almost. It's so bright. Uh, the melodies are so much stronger on this. And um, Beatrix has that cool harpsichord like synth maybe. It might be a real harpsichord. I'm not really sure. Uh, but it's Baroque and Gothic and spooky. Real great bass playing. Uh, from Raymond here and um, you know the the drum machine intro to Persephone contrasted with the banshee wailing and those cool icy 80s guitar stabs so cool uh, Aloysius is phenomenal those epic drums are great the waterfall vocals and then the closer domino it's like listening to a latin mass like it's just so beautiful sounding the way the the vocals are arranged uh, it rules. It really rules. It's, man, do I go four and a half stars? It's it's tough. Really tough, just the way I feel about the number one album. But I'm going to go four stars. I'm sorry. I'm still not quite there. Still not quite there. Four, but it's like 8.9. Last week, we did Echo and the Bunnymen, and just when I thought Joe couldn't be any dumber, he goes and pulls something like this and totally redeems himself so good even though he couldn't get up to four or five there I, I i get it my number one is bluebell knoll this is just their beautiful mess of extravagance in the production in the guitar in the lush arrangements in the vocals especially she sounds harder bigger crisper louder sweeter more angelic everything 
title track is great. Almost has like a rock intensity to it. Um, Ethel Bros, no, no, no idea how to say that, has this big underlying like roaring synth at times, just like the title track. Everything about the production, every little choice I just love here. And I think it almost gives like this gleamy, glammy, goth kind of feel, like pure decadence. Carolyn's Fingers is one of my favorite songs of all time. Shoegaze kind of getting turned up a little bit here. You just get like these purple, smoky, hazy kind of feel to it. Heavenly nature everywhere. Carolyn's Fingers and for Phoebe Still Baby are absolutely splendid right in the middle of the first half of the album. You get like Fever Dreams kind of vibes on Itchy Globo Blow, which is excellent. This album feels like if heaven was haunted. It's like, it's just so cool. Nico Buff is lush and gorgeous and illuminating with a killer soaring guitar work and solo in it. Suckling the mender with a little bit of like an island kind of groove to it with great winding vocals wrapped around it and a very romantic guitar tone that signals like everything the Sundays want to do with their guitar. A kissed out red float boat has a really cool jangly groove to it mixed with some sparkling almost, you know, like Joe said, 8-bit video game synth to it. I love the bass sound on this album with like that elasticity. Closer is magic and a great sign-off. It's just the iconic, angelic, but still kind of like unfamiliar, sublime dream pop and shoegaze. It's just perfect for me. It's just like this wide open, lush poetry with just this cosmic nature to it. Five stars. I think this is a masterpiece of an album. Bluebell Bell Noel, I think I nominated in 87. I can't remember. That's a loaded year. I might be wrong, but I may have. Well, my number one is Heaven or Las Vegas. And I think it is their best album by quite a lot. They're really figuring out how to take these ethereal textures that they've been developing and and kind of using to build this style of theirs and finally like turn them into songs. It feels so much more structured. The vocal melodies seem to be the focus. And, you know, on past records, at least it seems like, you know, he's just like building up these guitar parts and drum loops and stuff in the studio and she's coming in and singing on top of it. Here, it feels like, the vocals take precedence like everything's playing to the melody and everything's supporting the melody and it works so much better i don't know if they actually changed their um you know mode of working maybe it is still just her coming in and singing on top but it doesn't feel that way ice blink luck i think is a really good pop song the drum sounds i think are the best they've been and they're mixed way more effectively uh some of the toms even sound like real drums on this record and they're finding ways to make these dreamy soundscapes um so it doesn't feel as by numbers um you know they're they're using like different sounds more frequently uh 50 50 clown has that pulsing bass and jittering synth um along with like some slightly different guitar tones for guthrie uh fotse politic is i think really tuneful they're finally getting the vocal mix right. I think it's still dreamy um, without, you know, completely washing her out with reverb. It's like just the right amount. Uh, Wolf in the Breast, I think, works really well. Built on these uh, simple arpeggiated guitar chords, you know, not trying so hard to make this heavily textured uh, sound, just kind of playing straight uh, arpeggios. And it's enough to to build the atmosphere and for her to sing on. Um, I think it's her best singing. I think it's her best melodies. I think the production is better than on any other record. And I think it's their most creative uh, effort as well. So four stars for me for Heaven or Las Vegas. All right. Number one, Heaven or Las Vegas. And this was a bit of a surprise, maybe shock to me uh, by how good it was. And I feel like for as much praise as it gets, like it, it just hasn't been like marketed properly to someone like me because like no one, nothing anyone has ever said about this album has made me want to listen to it. I listened to like 30 seconds of the first track and I was like, this is incredible. Like why didn't people talk about how much of an R&B influence this has? Like I've never heard one person mention like the ABBA-esque close harmonies all over this album. Like it's, it's incredible. Like 
everything about this album is amazing. It's easily my number one favorite album of 1990. It's five stars with a bullet. Like it, it's so good that like I have a problem putting other albums by this band like even near it as far as stars go because I mean I, I listened to this album 10 15 times in the past couple of weeks it took over uh always which I listened to 12 times of uh, the new always album uh and this one sort of pushed that off my you know my mental it's gone I don't even care I'm just listening to heaven or Las Vegas now and it's just so good. The drum machines, the grooves, the R&B vocals. Uh, Frazier adds so much new technique. She's doing a, a bit of a rapid fire vocal on some of these songs. Um, and you still have like the really dreamy 80s synths on 5050 Clown. You have a, a, a tiny sliver of the post-punk sound coming in on the title track. Uh, I wear your rings. Close harmonies are just absolutely incredible. And at the two minute and 30 second mark, just one of the coolest vocal parts I've ever heard in my entire life. Uh, Thoughts of Politic is like, uh, you know, Kate Bush and the Smiths. Like it's got the six, eight waltz time to it. Um, folky melody. This is absolutely gorgeous. Incredible. Uh, Ice Blink Luck. Just gorgeous harmonies just incredible and you now she's actually writing lyrics with meaning this time and maybe it's just dumb luck but like all these songs just have like that heft to them like something behind the beauty that i think really elevate it even if the lyrics aren't always coherent uh it's just like that extra what i've been looking for this whole time uh to kind of push the band over the top for me so yeah i mean it's five stars it's just it's it's heaven it's better than las vegas it's heaven i got it's another one where i just wish someone had sat me down and been like listen you're really gonna like this album it's um, nothing like anything else just listen to it quit acting like that sways your mind come on you have to be forced to listen to these if someone had said had mentioned the r&b sort of you know, influence on her vocals and the grooves and everything. I would have jumped at this, jumped okay. at it. Listen to uh, the first Joy Division record. It's got Steely Dan vibes on it. You'll love it. Give it a shot. Try it. I've already heard it. It sucks. All right. Well, there we go. Final thoughts. Joe, big Cocktoo Twins fan. Who would have thought? Huge fan. And I should have known because Elizabeth Frazier, ever since I heard her on Teardrop, I believe that's what she's on for Massive Attack. Like her, her vocals are just so good. Um, one critic called them the, the mouth of God, I believe, because they were so pretty. And it's totally true. I mean, if I didn't know if she had like that Kate Bush in some of these songs and I uh, should have listened a long time ago because it is a great band. Wonderful third week of Cram Tober, Cram Fest, whatever this is. Finally, something I can relate to. I had a, I had a great time. Uh, just get me to the psychedelic furs, please. Oh, uh, you know what? I am. <sighs> Will the furs be the band where all three of us can come together? Uh, I hope so. I would not hold my breath. Joe preferred Cock 2. Jason preferred Echo. Uh, who's, the, who's the first week again? Who's Gradu? Neither of us were with that on board. You yeah, didn't like him that much. <laughs> so the, only, the only thing left is that we all come together at the end of the month. We'll see. All right. Well, look, I, I think people are going to be very upset with me this week, and that's fine. I don't care. But I will say... <laughs> They, Cocktoo Twins, I think do deserve a lot of credit for kind of pioneering dream pop as a genre. And I just like, and I like dream pop, dream pop. I like a lot of dream pop acts, especially later ones. I think a lot of bands that have done it in the 21st century have taken the template set by them and done it more effectively and written better songs like Beach House and Still Corners and groups like that. I think for me, 
the fact that they're recording the bulk of their discography in the 80s hinders it a bit. I think the sound of the records just does not support the sound that they're going for. There's a thinness to it, and especially in the drum machine stuff. It's just, it, it could be so much more lush than it already is. And I don't love her voice, so that's always going to hold it back. Yeah. Just can't have that big of a blind spot to be like, it's 80s, I'm out. I'm not, I'm 80s, it's, it's out. I'm. It's thin and brittle sounding, I'm out. The girl singer who's not plain, I'm out. I don't like my female singers to sound like fairies, that's all. Sorry. All right. Well, let us know what you think of Cocktoo Twins and let us know how upset with me you are. Drop it down in the comments, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell for notifications and check out all the links in the video description, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, website, Patreon, and merch. If you'd like to support the channel further, just a dollar a month gets you access to our Discord. You can hang out, talk to all of the other Tastes like music fans in the community, listen to music, uh, listening parties happening all the time, They're playing games, trivia, all kinds of fun stuff. Check it out. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one. Mm -hmm.